Karen Krauss grew up in Santa Clara, California, and as a young athlete, she swam for the Santa Clara Swim Club and other local teams. She attended the University of California, where she competed and earned a varsity letter in swimming, and graduated with a degree in journalism and physical education. She started her newspaper career at the Savannah News Press, where she was the first woman to work in the sports department, and worked at seven other dailies before being hired by the New York Times in 2005. She began on the football beat, <clears throat> I can't imagine doing, and she's covered all the mainstream sports, including NASCAR and boxing. Now she covers golf, where she has advocated for the breakdown of the male-only memberships, and there are some interesting interviews online if, if you're curious. Karen currently lives in Florida, correct? Yeah, Florida. Yes. Though she resided in the Upper Valley for a brief period while researching her first book, Norwich, One Tiny Vermont Town Secret to Happiness and Excellence. Please join me in welcoming Karen Krebs. Thank you. Well, I am the antidote to bad weather. If you want a thaw, just invite me here. The, I spent the latter part of 2015 living here. And if you guys remember, that was one of the warmest um, Octobers, Novembers, Decembers ever. I think it was 65 on Thanksgiving. And by Christmas, people were saying, Karen, please go back to Phoenix. We want snow. So I think uh, it was foreordained that it would be nice weather this week. But I um, am so happy to see you guys here. Thank you for foregoing the very important meeting occurring at Tracy Hall. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about that issue because it pertains to something that I saw firsthand growing up in Santa Clara. Um, I think it's sort of fitting that this event got moved to a, a church because I feel as if I'm going to be preaching mostly to the choir in <laughs> describing the qualities that I think separate Norwich from other towns. Um, and what I'm talking about are just the freedom that you give your children to master their environment, that you give them ownership of their sports and activities so that they can develop resilience and independence, autonomy, competence, you know, a feeling that they're in control control and can master their um, lives, which, you know, I hate to tell all of you parents, but your jobs, if you do it right, is that you're not really needed. Um, they'll always love you, but you want them to be able to go forward on their own two feet. And I think you guys, the way you raise your children here, really gives them a step up in that respect. Um, and it's funny because here I am a California girl and I'm from, I'm a city slicker from the New York Times and I'm sure people thought, well, how can she come in and write about our town? But in a lot of ways, I think I was really uniquely qualified to write about Norwich. And even before I had stepped foot here, and I had never been to Vermont before 2014 when I came to start my research, I felt an instant kinship to this town when I started looking at your progression of Olympians. Um, of course, there was Betsy Snight in 1956 and 1960, but then um, when you had Mike Holland and Jeff Hastings, and then their brothers who followed, and then their peers, and I understood how that can happen because growing up in Santa Clara in the 1970s, amazingly enough, it was a lot like Norwich. It was more like Norwich than not like Norwich. It was considered the fruit basket of the United States at the time. I had plum orchards and apricot orchards within walking distance of my house. We used to, that was our playground. The orchards were our playgrounds then. And so you had that communitarian spirit. 
Um, everybody looked out for everybody else's kids. I mean, this sounds familiar, right? Um, also, you had Santa Clara Swim Club on the grounds of a former plum orchard that by the time I came along was the epicenter of swimming, not only in the United States, but in the world. And I looked it up because I couldn't believe it, but this is actually, I, I verified it with a couple of people. In 1968, that was the year that Mark Spitz was swimming for Santa Clara, and the year that he boasted that he would win seven gold medals, but didn't. He was one of 15 Santa Clara Swim Club swimmers that were on the US Olympic team. And those swimmers, if they had been a country, would have finished third in the medal standings. So that's the kind of um, sort of excellence that I grew up around. So I understood on a granular level how inspiring it can be when you have one or two exceptional performers in your midst that three of my first four swimming coaches were Olympic medalists. Um, they were Olympians like Jeff and Chris and Mike who volunteered their time to pay it back, to give back to the sport that had been so good to them. I saw on the deck every day Olympians, and they were doing the exact same training I was in the exact same facility with the same coaches. So what it does is it almost normalizes this extraordinary achievement. You don't think that you have to be superhuman to be an Olympian because it's the guy next door, it's the girl down the street, and it all, it's always sort of a reality check when I talk to people outside my bubble and they'll say, oh, you know, what is Michael Phelps like? I've never met an Olympian. And I'm thinking, wow, how blessed. I met my first Olympian at nine. Um, so we didn't have the Olympic send-offs that I think are just, they embody everything that is wonderful about this town. But what we did have every summer was the Santa Clara International Swim Meet. And you would have swimmers from all over the world come. Our home was nine-tenths of a mile from this swim center so I could walk there and people would set world records. It was covered by ABC Wide World of Sports, the same Wide World of Sports that had that opening montage of a ski jumper tumbleweeding down the mountain, which is why I think there weren't maybe more people following Mike and Jeff uh, <laughs> onto the mountains in, that, uh, in the 80s and 70s. I think that probably scared off a lot of parents but um, so we would see these um, these people perform and then we would see the next time we would see them they'd be at the Olymp at the Olympics so that when I saw like all the Olympians that this town has produced I was like yeah even though this is a very small town that doesn't surprise me I get that piece of it and then I started talking to the Olympians, and um, just the thread is so cool. So you have um, Tim Tetro, who is at Mike and Jeff's send-off, and he's inspired. And then he goes to the Olympics, and at his send-offs, you have, at different times, Brett Heil and Hannah Carney, and they both go to the Olympics and on and on, and there's just this continuity that is lovely. And there was this story that um, Tim Tetro told me, and he almost told it kind of offhandedly, that he had just gotten out of high school, and he didn't know if he was going to continue skiing because it just felt like, you know, maybe I should just concentrate on school now that I'm in, in college. He couldn't compete in skiing in college because they had dropped, um, I think, Nordic. So he was thinking maybe it's just time for me to concentrate on my studies. And then, out of the blue, he gets a postcard in the mail from Mike Holland, who is off you know, competing in Europe on the World Cup circuit. And Mike, 
for whatever, you know, how, why ever the spirit moved him, wrote Tim and just said, hey, Tim, one day this can be you. You know, I'm really looking forward to seeing that happen. Or just some little two sentence note of encouragement. It probably took him three minutes to write and you know, maybe twice as long to find the stamp to put on it. But that simple gesture, that little act of kindness made all the difference for Tim. It was the difference maker. He gets this postcard when he's really at a fork in the road and he doesn't know, you know which, what, which path to take. He takes this as a sign, wow, Mike wants me to keep competing? Well, shoot, then I have to keep competing. And he ends up being a multiple Olympian. So I just found those stories over and over and over. And it really speaks to the generosity of spirit that starts with the parents. And you know, um, the parents don't tell their children here to not, you know, act, not do as I, uh, do, do as I say, you guys really try to be the people that your children, you want your children to become. And I think you see the effects in gestures as small as that by Mike. Um, I remember uh, Dan Frazier told me the story of when Hannah won the gold medal in 2010, he was so proud that he made bumper stickers. Am I getting this story right? So he makes the bumper stickers, he sells them, he gets a couple hundred dollars profit. So he gives Hannah the check. And she gets this check and it's this windfall that she wasn't expecting. So most people, what would they do? They would go and buy themselves something they've been um, coveting, not Hannah. Hannah took that check to the library and asked Beth Reynolds if she would use the money to buy sports books targeted at teenage girls. I mean, again, this is the generosity of spirit that I, it, it almost starts to sound, you know, like a broken record after a while. And I write about this in the Andrew Weeding chapter, but you guys all know the story of Andrew, takes up track as a senior in high school, and three years later, he's on an Olympic team. So he graduated from the University of Oregon, and then he turned pro, and he told me, you know, there are two kinds of athletes. There are 10-point athletes and there are one-point athletes. And of course, having spent his formative years in Norwich, Andrew was a 10-point athlete. He liked nothing better than to excel or succeed because that would lift up his teammates. He loved that his success would also help the team effort. He loved being part of something bigger than himself. So he thrived at Oregon when he was a part of this championship caliber team. So then he graduates and turns pro and now as a pro, you're no longer a 10-point player. You are a one-point player. It is all about you. A lot of your money, especially in these Olympic sports, is tied up in bonuses. So you have to perform well to get paid. And so it's all about you and your success. And that's what Andrew said. Even in college, he would come across the one-point players who they didn't care how anyone else did. As long as they won, it was all good. So Andrew said he totally struggled with this idea that now all of a sudden every day it's about him. Every waking moment is devoted to himself. He felt like it, it was just a self-absorption with which he did not feel comfortable. Plus add to that the fact that he's now competing alongside his main rivals um, and so if he's struggling, instead of giving him pointers or tips or saying, hey, I noticed you're doing this or that, 
They're reveling in his struggle because, oh, if he's struggling, that's one less person I have to worry about at the big meet. So this was not a great environment for Andrew. So what he did in the lead up before the 2016 Olympic trials is he became a big brother. So he felt like he had to find his community within this very, um, you know, competitive environment. So he became a big brother to um, a teenage boy and took him out and tried to get his fill his communitarian spirit, that hole that he was missing through that. And again, I have to tell you, I haven't come across too many uh, Olympic athletes who in the lead up to an Olympic trials were spending time as a big brother, or big sister. So um, I'm going to tell you the, the story of uh, Tim and the postcard from Mike really struck me because I had a similar incident where someone's generosity of spirit, it just transformed my life. It put me on the path I'm on today, um, for better or worse. And I was going to just tell you the story, but I think I'll read it because I do include it in the book. So if you'll indulge me, it's a little long, but I, I think you'll um, get the point of why I um, wanted to include it. So let's see if I can find it. All right. Like the kids in Norwich, I grew up rubbing shoulders with and being taught by Olympians. Three of my first four coaches had won Olympic medals while training under the charismatic George Haynes, whose footprint on Santa Clara was equal to the ski coach Walter Prager's at Dartmouth. Those daily interactions with the very best humanized, almost normalized excellence. My parents, every year during the international swim, swim meet hosted um, at the swim center and televised by ABC's Wide World of Sports, would open our home less than a mile from the facility to participating athletes. And so for a single weekend every summer, I surrendered my queen size bed to Olympic medalists like Italy's Novella Caligaris and sat wrapped at the dining table listen, listening to their stories. I never did have the oppor opportunity to swim for Haynes who left Santa Clara in 1974 to coach college programs, first at UCLA and later at Stanford. But I was an indirect beneficiary of his charisma, my life set on its course by one of his disciples, Bill Rose. So Bill Rose, in 1976, when I was in eighth grade, was coaching a swimmer named Mike Bruner, who was the Michael Phelps of his day. Supremely talented in the butterfly, freestyle, and individual medley, and expected to contend for Olympic medals in multiple events at the upcoming 1976 Summer Games. In an era when it was cool for men to wear their hair in feathered mullets, Mike kept his head cleanly shaved, adding to his intimidating aura. Not that it required any reinforcement. He had a reputation for completing training sets that were unfathomable to the rest of us, like a 100 meter freestyle nonstop in which he averaged under one minute in each 100, repeated 100 times. I had since moved to De Anza Aquatics where Bill Rose was the head coach and like all the kids on the team, I was in awe of Mike. So in eighth grade, in the spring, I was assigned a school project, Create Your Own Magazine. So of course, I did a swimming magazine, Splash. My dad asked me, so who are you gonna do your Q&A with? And it may be hard for you to appreciate this now because I am actually standing up here and uttering complete sentences, but when I was 13, I was so shy, I was afraid of my shadow. I could barely talk to any stranger, and the idea of talking to Mike Bruner, who was godlike in my mind, was unfathomable. My dad might as well have suggested I interview the man on the moon. So my dad said, you know, you need to talk to Coach Rose and, and set this up. 
So I did. He, my dad was, he accompanied me to practice and made sure that I talked to Coach Rose. And I asked him with my heart in my throat if he thought Mike might be able to spare a few minutes. Rose told me to prepare my questions and stay after practice the next day. He would make sure that Mike talked with me. Decades later, as a reporter with the New York Times, I would regularly be reminded of the gift Rose had given me because most gatekeeper coaches built moats around their athletes and refused to lower the drawbridge. Rose told Mike he had an interview, and I would only find this out, by the way, years later that he didn't tell him the interview was with a 13-year-old swimmer on his team. So Mike naturally thought, oh, finally, the San Jose Mercury is going to talk to me, or Sports Illustrated, or the San Francisco Chronicle. So I'm sure he was mortified to be greeted by a pigtailed pipsqueak holding three by five index cards in trembling hands. But if Mike was disappointed, he didn't show it. He was gracious with his answers, and my completed magazine earned an A. At my father's suggestion, I made two extra copies for Bill and Mike. I was so excited for them to see that I had earned the highest grade for my efforts and theirs. The Olympic trials that year were being held the following month in Long Beach, California, an hour's flight from the Bay Area, and my father took me to the event. The night before we arrived, Mike failed to make the Olympic team in the 400 meter freestyle. Earlier, he was fourth in the 200 freestyle, missing an individual berth by one spot. Disappointed by the way his meet was unfolding, Mike was in a lousy frame of mind for his best event, the 200 butterfly, which he was swimming on the day we arrived. I was able to reach the pool deck and deliver a copy of my magazine to Bill who read my interview as I stood holding my breath. Now, can you imagine that? Most coaches that I know would have gone, oh, how nice, thank you, and the minute I turned my back, it would have been in the garbage can or they never would have looked at it again. But, my, but Coach Rose, bless him, he did read the Q&A. His expression grew animated and he said, this is fantastic. He said he was going to make sure Mike read it right away. I found out later what transpired next. He found Mike brooding under the bleachers, handed the magazine to him, and made him read an answer to one of my questions out loud. This is what he had to read aloud. I'd say that swimming is at least 90% mental. You can work harder than anyone else but lose a race because you don't have a positive attitude. The swimmer with the best attitude is the one that will win the race. Mike, in effect, delivered his own pep talk. He won the 200 butterfly in the final that night to secure his first individual berth to the Montreal Games. When Mike met with reporters afterward, he was asked how he overcame the disappointments of his earlier races. This was his response, as it appeared in the next day's Long Beach Press Telegram. A little girl from the club interviewed me for a class project and had gotten an A on the paper. In it, I talked a lot about hard work, having the will to win, and things like that. Reading it brought me back to reality. I think I had given up in the 400 free. The next day, Rose produced a copy of the paper and pointed to the quote, which I read and reread. It was hard for me to grasp that something I had written, me, this person afraid of her own shadow, who was afraid to even talk to Mike, that I could have helped him make that Olympic team. I turned to my father on the pool deck and told him that I wanted to grow up to tell people's stories for a living. And, you know, I had written this story a few years ago for the New York Times, and it was during the 2012 Olympic trials, and Michael Phelps' coach, Bob Bowman, came up to me, and he said, you know, Karen, your story on Bruner kind of brought a tear to my eye. And I appreciated what he was saying, but the reality is, 
in this day and age, because the stakes are so high and um, these swimmers are being pulled in so many different directions, the best ones anyway, where there's so much financially at stake, there's no way that a 13-year-old girl would have gotten by Bob Bowman to interview Michael Phelps. So while, he, while that story brought a tear to his eye, he was never going to replicate it with uh, Michael. So there are a couple lovely postscripts to this story, which as you can see, Coach Rose and Mike Bruner both would have fit in very well in this town. Um, so when I started working at the New York Times, after the Olympics, Mike sent me a postcard from Montreal. And then after the Olympics, he went back to Stanford. I went to high school. And you know, our paths never crossed again. So. A few months after I had started at the Times, I received this reader email out of the blue. And it began, you probably don't remember me, but you must be that Karen Krauss from De Anza Swim Club. This is Mike Bruner, and I just want to tell you that I tell the story of how you helped me make the Olympic team all the time when I speak about my Olympic experience. I'm just really proud of you to see that you've risen so high in your profession. So I read this email and I'm chuckling. So I respond immediately and say, do I remember you? <laughs> For better or worse, you're why I'm doing this crazy job. And so. Um, when uh, the second funny postscript is after I wrote the story about this, I received another email out of the blue. Um, sometimes my emails are terrifying, but sometimes they are um, wonderful. These were two of those examples. So I received an email from the woman who had been my very best friend in seventh and eighth grade. And she said, Karen, I read with interest your story on Mike Bruner. I, I totally remember that Splash magazine you did. But you know, that was an extra credit assignment. Because I remember I didn't do it, but you were really into it. <laughs> so there you go. My life turned on an extra credit assignment, <laughs> which tells you that I have a lot of Hannah Carney in me. Um, <laughs> So when I read that email to my husband, he was silent for a second. And he said, that explains so much. <laughs> anyway, but you know, here's the thing. I've been, my first Summer Olympics was 1992. And even then, the athletes were still basically amateurs when they competed in the Olympics. They were making the bulk of their money still. They would earn their medals, earn their renown, and then they would cash in on it. But shortly thereafter, they loosened the restrictions, and you could become a pro and still compete in the Olympics. And I think that's, what, that's when big money really entered the sporting, the Olympic movement for sure. So now broadcasters, you know, the broadcasting rights went through the roof, and then that money trickled down. That made corporations interested, and then corporations are looking for endorsers. And so I think if I look back on things, that's really the beginning of this, you know, industrialized sports complex that has trickled down in the last 20, 30 years to the youth level. And now what I see more and more, and I'm around young kids and their parents a lot in the course of just covering Olympic sport events, and I just run into so many kids who I'm not really sure if the passion for the sport is theirs or their parents. Like, are they doing the sport because like Mike Holland, it doesn't matter if they're really crummy at it at first because they are just so in love with the process. Mike told me that he can remember so many weekend trips home from competitions in the Hastings wood paneled station wagon when he was in the back seat and he was the only one without a trophy. You know, all the Hastings boys had trophies, but Mike Holland, nothing. And he said he didn't care because 
those few seconds that he was in the air, he felt like a bird in flight, and he loved that feeling. And he just wanted to try to get better and better and, and just become the best ski jumper he could be. It didn't matter if he wasn't the best in his age group, in the country, in the world. He just wanted to be the best ski jumper that Mike Holland can be. And I don't see that enough anymore. I'll, I'll talk to kids and I get the sense that they are doing the sport because they want to please someone, whether that's their coach or their parents. And they think that, you know, I, I can remember my swimming career was hugely valuable for having this perspective that um, is really healthy and that I saw a lot in this town of you are a person first and then a performer. I swam with a woman in college who set a world record in the 200 butterfly and I remember so clearly that her parents were separated at the time and she trained for this 200 fly thinking if I can break the world record I bet my, that might get my parents back together again. So she goes out, she's so motivated, she breaks the world record. Her parents divorce shortly thereafter. She never came close to that time again. So you know, you never know what people's, um, what, the, what is driving them. And here's the thing, I talk to so many parents who say, things to me like, well, what is the best way for me to, um, you know, to get Joni or Johnny a college scholarship? Or, or I think my Johnny or Joni could really be an Olympic swimmer, but do they need to, they just need the right coaching. And here's the deal, most of the Olympians that I've dealt with, that was never their end game. They just loved what they did and they loved the process, they loved the um, the empowerment that they got from um, the sense of mastering these very difficult races and then they just loved to improve in increments and before they knew it they made an Olympic team and Hannah's dad is here and I know he can speak to that. I mean, Hannah didn't set out to become the best mogul skier ever. She just really liked the idea of skiing over these mounds and skiing kind of outside the lines, if you will. Um, so what is becoming now? And I just so love the fact that this town has a no-cut recreational league because I think that when we have these leagues that are only available to the most skilled players, whether they're six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you are sending the message to children that if you aren't good at something, you might as well not even try. So more and more I see subtly and not people acting out this marketing campaign, this marketing slogan that I saw at the 1996 Olympics by an apparel company, second place is the first loser. All right, so if second place is the first loser, how many winners are there? I mean, there are not a lot of winners. That makes most of us losers. And I'm sorry, but sports was never a zero-sum game for me, but that's what I'm seeing more and more is that because of this um, yearning to get college scholarships to Olympic births, pro careers, it's, it's that or bust. And so more and more I'm seeing parents who I absolutely know beyond a shadow of a doubt and I even saw it at USC when I was there because um, some of the scholarship athletes who were also Olympians and record holders made it very clear to me that if you are not a scholarship athlete, you are nothing. So here's the thing, I swam from the age of nine to 21. And I never made a U.S. national team. I never made a U.S. Olympic team. I did not get a college scholarship. I walked on to USC. So with the way this 
professionalized movement has trickled down to youth sports, I guess that makes all those years a waste of time because my end game, what was it? I didn't get anything extrinsic out of that all those years. And that makes me so sad because there is not a day that goes by that I don't appreciate even more those years that I spent in the pool because through them I developed first off my most enduring friendships. Um, I was in the Bay Area earlier in the month and met up with the with a woman who I met when I was nine and we are still the best of friends and if you look at my friends my circle of friends now most of them are um, people I swam with age group or college we all have such divergent lifestyles that if you put us all in a room together and quizzed us, you would think, what on earth do these women have in common? I mean, why are they friends? But those years spent together in all of that chlorinated water just formed lasting bonds. I wouldn't give that up for any Olympic medal. Um, the life skills that I developed, the self-discipline, the um, delayed gratification, the goal setting, the um, perseverance, the persistence, um, I've had many Olympics where editors have said, how is it that you are still standing? Because um, especially in the Phelps years, I would be putting in 20, 21 hour days and I would just say, well, you know, it's kind of like Christmas training and swimming. I mean, you just learn to get through it. You learn that as tired as you are, you can always push through. You have that self-discipline. Um, and I still swim to this day, so I still have this physical activity for life. So if you want to say that my swimming career was a total waste of time and in this zero-sum game that youth sports have become in so many areas, it is fine, but you know, I'm just not buying it. And I think for all of these reasons that I've just described, this is why when I came to Norwich within a few days, I felt right at home. And it's really going to be a challenge for, um, you know, the, for the athletes here moving forward. Um, you guys have happening right now what was happening in Santa Clara in the 50s where you have people who are talking about like, okay, so let's develop this, let's raise this orchard and build this Hewlett Packard, you know, building. Oh, it's just one building. We still have all these miles and miles of orchards. Well, 20 years later, you don't even recognize the landscape because it became easier and easier to build more buildings and I'm not saying it's better or worse but what the, happened in the Silicon Valley is they decided it was more important to their emphasis became creating or inventing the future rather than preserving the past. And what I've seen tangibly is a real sense of isolation that I never remembered there being before. People don't know their neighbors the way we did growing up. Um, people live behind gated gates and gated communities. They have, you know, people. They hire people to do all of the activities that bring you into that help you to interact with your neighbors on a day-to-day -day basis um, their kids are feeling so isolated because they're being spirited away they're homeschooled they're being spirited away to private coaching to um, places far afield to pursue their sports and they don't have that large social safety net that you guys take for granted here um, and you know, then I, I was when I was in the Bay Area. I went to this uh, swim meet, and beginning level, A, B, C student um, swimmers. So these are the bottom rungs of the competitive ladder, and I was astonished. Um, there were several. Pa 
parents. I just sat in the stands with all the parents and observed what was going on. I was there to do a swimsuit story because I had been told, and it was confirmed by my eyes, that there are eight, nine, and 10-year-olds wearing $250, $300 high-tech performance suits. So, and when you ask them, well, why are you wearing these suits? Um, it's like, oh, well, these are the suits that Katie Ledecky wears, and you know, these are the suits that Michael Phelps wears, and there's no earthly reason why an eight-year-old should be wearing a high-performance uh, tech suit. But the, again, the parents think, well, I want to give my eight-year-old every advantage. I mean, it's all well-meaning, but honestly, it's kind of crazy. So, all right, I witnessed that, but this is what I also saw, parents using their phones and their tablets to record their children's races. And then when their kids are done, they would come up to the bleachers still dripping wet and breathing hard from the exertion of their race. And their parents would thrust these screens in front of them and have them replay their races, I guess to see what they did wrong. But I mean, in a 25 breast, how much, you know, what, what, what is an eight-year-old going to figure out in a 25-yard breast what he or she did right or wrong? And I just thought, like, wow. Even if you are the kid, that rare kid that is super interested in knowing what your race looked like at 8, 9, 10, or 11, shouldn't the coach be the one showing you the race? I feel like at that age, the parent's duty is to say, um, Hun honey, are you hungry? Do you need a snack? Um, you know, do you want to go into your sleeping bag and play cards with your friends till your next race? I mean, that's what my parents did. And so I got a sense of just how crazy it is. And then my mind, even I... I swear to God, as I sat in those bleachers, I was thinking to a JV soccer game I went to at Hanover High. And I was sitting in the stands with, with parents surround surrounding me. And I looked around, and I couldn't believe it because not a single parent was on a smartphone or tablet. Now, of course, I found out later it's because your devices don't work here. <laughs> But I would maintain that is, that is um, a blessing in disguise because I really think we need to become less tethered to our devices. And you guys, through the accident of geography and I guess aesthetics, have that going for you. Um, in fact, on the way here, I just read a, a story about there's this whole movement underway about untethering yourself. People are actually going on vacations where they're not allowed to bring their devices. And you guys have this every day, so you're way ahead of the curve. But anyway, so I wanted to just read um, Julia Crass. I claimed her as local because Peter and Diana moved to Norwich after the Sochi Olympics. And as you guys probably know, the slope style skiing team was finalized Monday, and she missed it. I mean, I still think she's amazing. But um, I wanted to read a bit of her story because it kind of gives you the idea that this, um, this industrialized you know, youth sports complex, it is changing um, the nature of the sports themselves. Um, let's see if I can uh, find it now. The professionalization of Olympic sports and the greater commitment of time, energy, and resources required to keep up has created an environment in which anyone not actively working to become better at a sport is getting worse. The relentless march of progress was highlighted 11 months after Julia Crass's Olympic debut when a 14-year-old snowboarder became the youngest X Games gold medalist. Because the competition never rests, Julia's ski coaches were adamantly opposed to her participating in high school soccer during her senior year. They didn't care that it was skiing's off season. They wanted Julia to attend conditioning camps with other members of the US slope style team in Australia or New Zealand where they could take advantage of winter conditions. In defiance of her coaches, 
and in a nod to the Norwich way, Julia rejoined the Hanover High soccer team as a midfielder, a position she favored because it allowed her to allowed her to distribute the ball to her teammates. It was important to her, she said, to be a normal teenager whenever possible. Besides, with the previous soccer season ending with a loss in the semifinals, Julia felt as if she had unfinished business. So she trained two hours a day with her soccer teammates and, and then worked out on her own to stay in shape for skiing. After Hanover won their state title, the happiest player in the victory pile was Julia. She felt certain her self-imposed break, far from thwarting her progress, would enable her to return to skiing feeling recharged. But the double life she leads is occasionally exposed. Her high school's team's quarterfinal game came down to penalty kicks, and as Julia lined up for her attempt, which she converted, the crowd broke into a chant of USA. Looking back at their daughter's eventful 2014, Peter and Diana Crass were proudest that she gained admittance to Dartmouth as a member of the class of 2019. Her decision to finish high school with online classes hadn't hurt her academic standing. The Crasses viewed college as the connective span that would convey their daughter from the sports mountaintop to the veil of mortals. It was a bridge that Julia had never given much thought to having to cross until February 2015 when she caught too much air on a jump during a training run on Northern California's Mammoth Mountain, landed hard, and tore the ACL and meniscus in her right knee. The, rehabil uh, the rehabilitation was arduous. Her right leg muscles atrophied during the time she spent on crutches. It was a while before she could contemplate skiing again, and yet Julia spoke of her torn ACL with the same nonchalance as a copy machine vendor might describe a paper cut. Almost everyone tears their ACL at one time or another, she said. To her, the injury was just one of the pockets of turbulence that are unavoidable when cruising at high altitude. Julia was still rehabilitating her knee when she started classes at Dartmouth in the fall of 2015. She relished the college experience for the opportunity it afforded to broaden her intellectual horizons and make friends outside of skiing. She took winter quarters off to train out west and compete on the international circuit, but she was adamant about not letting skiing take over her life. Her parents applauded her approach. As Julia's father told me, if she wants to drop sports and concentrate on schooling, we'd be fine with that. So I want you to think about that, which I just read, and ponder this. Somewhere there are people who are in this zero-sum game, you know, attitude, who are going to say, well, Julia didn't make the Olympic team, you know, that's kind of a waste of time for her participating the last four years. She should have retired after the 2014 Olympics. You know, you just have to, it depends on the prism through which you see sports. And then I just wanted to read one last thing and then I'm gonna open it up to questions. Maybe I need to put on my armor first, but um, the Norwich way gives kids ample space to discover their passions and pursue them for their own reasons and at their own pace. Most of the Norwich Olympians pursued part-time work to cover the cost of their sports. As a teenager, the alpine skier Felix McGrath found a variety of jobs, and while he didn't make much more than minimum wage, the experiences were priceless. Finding and keeping those jobs forced me to be independent and responsible and accountable, Felix said. The culture created almost by accident in Norwich can be replicated elsewhere, but it requires parents to refrain from micromanaging their children's lives and inste instead act as their guides to charity, well-roundedness, curiosity, perspective, and a healthy life anchored by physical activity. Their mantra, as I said before, is not do as I say, not as I do. The adults in Norwich make a conscious effort to be the people they want their children to become. <laughs> All right, so um, does anyone have any questions for me? I'm happy to answer anything. Yes. Um, 
for financial reasons are, well, they say it's for financial reasons that they are, um, they can only have so many people in each sport. But it's interesting, my, my attitude is where there's a will, there's a way. I know there are a number of companies, Nike being one, where they will go in and sponsor um, teams in disadvantaged areas. And their whole idea isn't just, these aren't like mini traveling teams. I mean, those come later. But these are teams where they just want to pour money into areas that may um, not have as much financial wherewithal, just so that, like you said, more kids can be exposed to more sports. And obviously, they have um, a stake in this because they want children to be physically active so that they will buy Nike gear for the rest of their lives, right? They'll get them on the, um, have Nike customers for life. Um, I've also heard of, um, I spent two months in Oregon um, this winter, or l end of last year, and there was this really neat story I read where the cross country, it, might, it was either cross country or track team at the local high school, the coach as a bonding exper um, experience, a team bonding event, he had his team take woodshop. And in Woodshop, they built a boat. So they live in a fishing village. And so they built a boat, which they then auctioned off to help defray their costs. What a great idea. I just, I thought this could, this could have been a Norwichian idea because what he was doing was saying, okay, first we're gonna do something where um, we're all working together. We're recognizing that we do not exist in a bubble. We do not run in a bubble, that we are part of a bigger community. And this community, many people make their livelihoods uh, in fishing. And so we are going to provide something that will be useful to these fishermen. Now, um, and what a great way to raise money, you know, for, uh, to help defray costs. Um, or, you know, it, you could, if it, you could look at it another way and maybe those people could have built that boat and then donated it to a fisherman in need of a vessel. So um, I just think there are a lot of ways if you get creative and if you are viewing things through the right prism, if you want if you have this generosity of spirit that you want to help, you can find a way. Um, and I want to speak to the rec league piece because Hannah told me the best story that Hannah was so athletic that whatever sport she tried, if there had been cut, she was never going to get cut from these teams. And she said for her, the beauty of the no-cut teams for her growing up was that it exposed her to girls she would not have otherwise met. So there were girls on her team that were not athletically inclined, who maybe didn't even really love athletics, but they liked being part of a team and they liked the social aspect of it. And so in that way, they entered her orbit. And because they played these, um, they were on these teams year after year after year, it gave her several years to really get to know these girls whose pro 
paths she never would have crossed with otherwise. If there had been only the most skilled people on these leagues, these girls wouldn't have gone out. They would have been intimidated and wouldn't have even tried. Here's the kicker. Those girls are her best friends to this day. And she told me that when she would have disappointments um, in skiing, these women were able to pick her up because you know, they didn't even know what a disappointing finish was in skiing. So they had a completely different perspective than she did. They were able to give her the distance that she needed so that she wasn't viewing herself through her very telephoto harsh lens. And isn't that fantastic? I mean, at the end of the day, those friendships are what you're going to remember long after you forget like what trophy you won when. I recently spoke to an Olympian and he told me, you know, Karen, I spent so much of my elite career feeling as if I couldn't really be friends with my competitors because I had to have that psychological edge over them, so I kept my distance. Again, we're talking about the isolating yourself piece of it. So I never really made very many friends among the um, people that I was competing with. And I didn't think that was you know, that big of a deal. And this person did win national titles and was um, uh, made, had podium finishes in international events. But now he said, 10 years out of his sport, he kind of wishes that he had focused more on the relationships and less on the championships. Because he sees that these other people, these competitors, they all have these great relationships. And he feels sort of on the outside looking in. And you know, you can't make that time up. It's too late. I also think that when you are around people who are for whom an activity does not come as easy to them or who are not as skilled, it really gives you a sense of empathy. It helps develop your empathy. And you realize like, oh wow, not everyone, this does, not everyone picks this up as quickly as I do. And it gives your um, child a perfect learning opportunity to develop empathy, to, to show kindness to someone who needs a little help figuring these skills out and mastering them. Any other questions? Yes. Karen, I wonder if anything that um, you experienced in Norwich changed the way you practice your profession as a journalist and whether any of the lessons that you draw um, for sports um, you see having any application in the very different business of newspaper. So the question was, do I think that the time I spent in Norwich has it changed how my relationship and how I deal with the athletes I cover, or has it um, changed anything in my perspective? That, and whether you think the lessons that you draw for, for the business of sports have any application in the business of the news. Well, um, integrity is a big part of both, right? So, um, yeah. Um, and that's, I think, why the, when the Norwich story, when the person, um, when I was emailed, this, um, this reader sent me an email at the Sochi Olympics saying, I noticed you're at the Olympics. Do you know that there's this town in Vermont that has put um, an Olympian on every US Olympic team since 1984? You should write about that. That um, I was really drawn to that because I was at an Olympics that cost $51 billion, that these facilities were built um, from scratch after the people who lived in the area were dislocated um, and their pets left to be rounded up and killed, but that's a whole nother story. Um, and 
the, you knew, you just knew that the minute the last event ended, most of these facilities would become very expensive white elephants. And I sat there watching all of this unfold, and I felt like we were just stagecraft for Val Vladimir Putin's world premiere. And I thought, gosh, this is so far from the Olympic ideal that drew me into the sport world, uh, um, I feel disillusioned. And Norwich really, when I came here and realized, wow, there is still a place that sees the purity of purpose and that sports is one piece in a bigger puzzle, it really renewed my faith in the um, Olympic ideal and the sports ideal. So yes, I think um, one of the, da one of the um, disheartening things about covering sports anymore, at, especially at the Olympics, is you cover these amazing results and finishes, and you're thinking, even as you write about these fantastic feats, wow, is this person going to be stripped of his or her medal in four, eight, or ten years? You know, like, there are people who finished fifth, sixth, seventh in Olympic races tr in track and field who are getting medals ten years later. Um, one thrower in track received an Olympic medal in the Atlanta airport in an impromptu ceremony. I mean, that guy was denied his great medals podium moment because there are people who don't have integrity, who are willing to do whatever it takes to win. Um, and by whatever it takes, that's usually using performance enhancing drugs. So yeah, the integrity piece in journalism or sports, it's the one and the same. But um, I think the athletic piece, it didn't really change for me because I think part of what allowed me to understand the athletes of Norwich and really see that they are special and they're worth writing about is that I've always taken a very humanistic approach to my coverage of athletes and I've never been that person focused merely on the result. I know from being a walk-on swimmer that um, sometimes the best stories are those of us that are finishing 6th, 7th, and 8th, and it's not just the people who are 1st, 2nd, and 3rd who have the most fascinating tales to tell. So I've always been very cognizant of that. Um, you know, Mike Collin, he never won an Olympic medal, but I uh, defy anyone to tell me of an uh, Olympic medalist with a much better story than Mike's, or Andrew's for that matter. So um, in that respect, it didn't change. But I'll tell you how living here and um, telling the stories of the athletes here did change me. I feel so much more aware as I go about my day-to-day -day life how can I today help someone who, is, who needs my help? Whether it's a kind word, a kind deed, volunteering, I do that a lot more than I did before. And I have Norwich to thank for that, and that is no small thing.